We've been looking at these parables of Jesus, these earthly practical stories that made sense to those listening to his teaching, but they had a deeper, a spiritual, even a heavenly meaning. So they were practical, yet they taught people something of God's kingdom. They brought those who were often far outside of God's word and his redemptive story in. They were invited in to be a part of that story and to have a deeper understanding and even a transformed life in who Jesus was and what he was teaching. Ironically, that upset the religious leaders in Jesus' day. In fact, they made a point of opposing him at every turn. And as he approaches Jerusalem for the last part of his earthly ministry, the final weeks and months of his time on earth before the cross, things get very, very tense. It's in this time that Jesus is teaching exclusively from these parables and choosing heroes and stories and concepts that absolutely confound and challenge the religious types. Jesus makes it abundantly clear that these people, these religious leaders, the Pharisees in particular, are not leading the people to know the redemptive story that God has written for them. Last week in the parable of the dishonest manager, we saw just how tense and how unsettling these stories, these parables from Jesus could become. I mean, let's face it, in that story, there's not a good person. There's really not a a together person in that story. Everyone is trying to get ahead at the expense of someone else. Jesus obviously felt that the religious leaders in his day were placing their own prominence, their own worldly success, their gain ahead of the calling God had placed upon them to lead his people to know and to serve him. He makes it clear that we are reminded as well in this, and it's made clear to us that we are prone to that same outcome, that same spiritual fate. We're sinful just like the people in Jesus' day. We fail to make disciples. We fail to call others to know Jesus. We fail to seek him in our own lives. If you've ever read the works of Dante or listened to any of the modern critiques of church, really any church tradition we could say in Christianity, We see this lack of a heart focus, of heart dedication to God and to the good news, to the gospel. It's at the core, it's at the center of every misstep in the history of the church, in authors and arts and culture. And we see this in our history time and time again. We are rightly called out for not having a heart for God and for, frankly, our hypocrisy. We forget our mission. We forget and we lose ourselves as God's people. It's the story we see throughout the Bible and it's the story of us. And it's something we should take note of as we go into God's word today. God's word reminds us of this reality. There will be a lot of religious people in hell. If you've considered enough of what Jesus teaches in the Gospels, this is abundantly clear. If you've looked at it, if you've considered how he treated the religious leaders in his day, look at passages like Matthew 7, 22, where it says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and do many miracles? Then I will announce to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreaker. That's hard to hear. But it's something that we need to remember is in God's word. We know it's true. Jesus says it. He repeats it. He teaches it. And he applies it to the very religious people that should be following him. Yet somehow, they're missing everything that he's teaching. What does this tell us? In short, we can be very religious And look very together. And yet, not know Jesus. We can be extremely devoted to the practices, the procedures, and the trappings of religion. And not understand nor be changed by the gospel. We don't go all in on that gospel reality in our hearts. That's what we were warned about. We were warned about that last week. In that unique parable of the dishonest manager. 
This week, we're going to enter into another story where Jesus is once again addressing the religious types and specifically those Pharisees, the ones who scoffed at him in Luke 16, 14. And those Pharisees, they were often his target for a simple reason. They guided the entirety of the spiritual life of God's people, of the Jewish people. Their very legalistic and convoluted understanding of the Old Testament, the laws that they had added to and compounded with their own practices beyond what God clearly taught, had led God's people into a way of following him that frankly was different from his own heart. So as we enter this parable today, we're going to see Jesus continues what he began when he went after them last week, and he's going to issue them a powerful warning, specifically to those religious leaders in Israel, but to all those people and to us. We're receiving the same warning as well, and it can be summed up as this. You and I, we're living on borrowed time. We must decide now in our lives what truly matters. We are all destined to choose what we feel has eternal significance, and God is definitely calling us to do that. And perhaps today in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis, you may find, as I have, that we are all re-examining our lives and deciding what truly matters. Perhaps now more than ever, you're looking at things you once thought to be important, and God is stripping those things away as we've been talking about and saying, no, no, no. This doesn't matter. I matter. Your neighbor matters. Loving the people around you matters. Stopping and having a conversation with people matters. Perhaps today God is calling us to a change of heart, a change of direction. So let's jump into Luke chapter 16 again, beginning today in verse 19 through 31, and consider what truly matters. Let's read. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table, but instead the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off, with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received your good things just as Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here while you are in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you, so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot. Neither can those from there cross over to us. Father, he said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house, because I have five brothers, to warn them, so they won't also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, they should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. But he told him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. This is God's holy word. Talking about what matters in the light of eternity means we do consider that Eternity has only two possible outcomes. There's only two possible destinations for us. Presence with God in that new heavens and in that new earth. And the other possibility, according to scripture, is hell. We're not here to scare you, but we talk about it because Jesus talked about it. In fact, Jesus talked about heaven and hell more than any other person who spoke or wrote in scripture. So today, we need to take time and listen to Jesus And we're picking this up again in the context from last week's parable, the parable of the dishonest manager. Jesus ended that parable with an ominous warning for those religious leaders and for us in Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to to one 
and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. As we dig into this parable today, the question is, what is your passion in this life? Where is your heart? What's your actions, your habits, your thoughts, your energies? Where do they take you? Where do they focus you? We, we began this conversation last week. How do they affect those closest to you? Do they draw them closer to that gospel reality or push them farther away? That was the litmus test we gave last week to examining our heart and who we are serving, whether it's God or whether it's ourselves or, or something else. And Jesus is hammering this point home once again in today's parable. And the key idea, as you may have already picked up from the scripture we read today, is this. Where your heart's passion exists, where it exists now and today, will determine your trajectory for all of eternity. Let me say that again. Where your heart's passion is today, yesterday, tomorrow, where you place your energies, your habits, your thoughts, your monies, your, your focus, all of that will determine the spiritual trajectory of your life for all of eternity. Let's consider the focus in the trajectories of the two main characters in this parable Jesus told today. We're going to look here at verses 19 and 21, and we're going to look at the situation of each man in the story and where it begins. Let's read Luke 16, 19 through 21. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. But instead, the dogs would come and lick his sores. So first we have this rich man, and he was incredibly wealthy. He enjoyed the kind of life most people could never imagine. He took great care of himself, and he really loved and thought highly of himself. He has, as some might say today, the kind of love that Kanye would have for Kanye. Now, if you don't know Kanye West, he's a pretty big celebrity, and he's become a preacher of sorts, but he's famous for even talking and singing about the, the human proclivity, our, our sinful nature to focus and worry and only be about ourselves. And it's good that he talks about that. It's good that we consider that because we can all love ourselves more than anything else, or, or we can even love something else. And this man today, this rich man had this lifestyles of the rich and famous existence, and boy, did he think a lot of himself and focus on himself and care about himself. He had like a, a gold-plated Lamborghini and a house in the Florida Keys with boats and bikini-clad ladies and, and all of that. The, the fine linens that are referenced here would have been the finest Egyptian uh, woven materials, probably, you know, uh, like Egyptian cotton that you would find in, in the warm climate. And the fact that he wore purple clothing every day, that was clothing resort for the most wealthy, not even the mostly wealthy, but the super rich and for royalty because it took months of processing to make just one bolt of purple cloth of that purple linen. It was that hard to make. This was a guy that was walking around flashing his status. Everybody saw who he was and, and what he was about. He dressed in the finest. He ate the finest food. He showed out big. He had it all. People who were poor would long to have the scraps that fell from his table. And to Jesus' audience, that concept would make sense because the bread that would fall from the table... They didn't have napkins back then the way we did, and they would take these cheap pieces of bread and actually use them to wipe their hands or for the dipping oil. They would clean up the table with them. They, they actually used bread for that sort of thing, and they'd throw it out to the, to the dogs. And so the dogs we see and the dogs that come to the poor man later, these aren't your cute little puppies like my new puppy. This is a feral dog, a wild dog. This is not a dog that you would want to, to pet or, or take home and adopt, and they would throw it out and feed the wild dogs with it. It was basically what they cleaned up the kitchen and the dining room with, and the poor people would long just to have it. This guy would just throw it on the ground because he had so much, he didn't think about it. It didn't matter. It didn't matter to him at all. And we get the idea he did this every day. He may have even been doing this during the Sabbath, making those who served him work on the Sabbath. He didn't care about any of those things, what God meant, what other people needed or, or what mattered to them, it was all about him. That's who he was. 
if we're honest, the person in this story could be any one of us. It could be any one of us. Any one of us who could say, you know, maybe we would say to ourselves, but that's not me. I don't have fancy clothes. I don't have any of that. I don't have a big car, an expensive vacation house, or vast wealth. But the point here Jesus is making to his audience, who were also not wealthy people, was not that all wealthy people were bad. This is about hard attitude. You can be all about wanting and desiring and seeking after those things, whether you have them or not. That hard attitude, Jesus is saying, if this is what you're all about, even look at this person and he has all of it. Even if you think that's what you're all about, I'm going to give you an example, Jesus says in this parable. I can imagine him thinking, we're going to give you an example of the ultimate of what you are all seeking. That would be the rich man in this parable. And that parable, that heart desire, that could be any one of us, any one of those people in the crowd, any one of us today. We think that if we get these things, they're going to somehow satisfy us. It's all we need to make it good and to have it be right. Now in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, people may be deciding what they think is important. But even at the beginning, we saw people, they were all about themselves. People thought they needed six years worth of toilet paper. And I think for many years, we will, be, we will debate why people thought they needed six years worth of toilet paper. Our hard attitude, this could be any one of us. What is it that you're passionate about that you deeply desire today? What is it that you're tempted to serve or bow down and place on the altar of your life? We've talked about this in some of the parables and Jesus is pulling that back into focus today. That part of our sinful nature, all of us, that thinks that if we just get to this point, it's going to be enough and we're going to find satisfaction. What are you passionate about in your life besides God? Be honest with yourself today and consider what those things or what that thing is a spouse, a job, status, your uh, wealth, your, your appearance, the accolades of other people, financial security, whatever it is. Think about that. Jesus draws a contrast here that is very vivid between the rich man who is so very rich and this poor man who is just utterly poor. He wanted that bread that they use, as I said, as napkins. He would have loved to have had that to eat, but the wild dogs gobbled it up and they would lick these oozing kind of disgusting wounds that he had. He was not a leper necessarily, but he was someone that was very dirty and unclean and these feral dogs were torturing him and he was crippled and they would take him and they would literally, the word here in Greek in the, in the original language is balo, and they would dump him or drop him. They would literally dump him off at the gate of this very rich man. You see, in that culture, if you couldn't be taken care of, your last best chance was to be placed near the gate for the wealthiest people or the wealthiest person in your town. And part of their social and religious requirement was almsgiving. And when they walked past, they were supposed to drop some, some money, some change to you. You literally had to be a beggar. It was the only way you would survive. And so someone would take you and literally dump you at the wealthiest spot they could find, hoping that someone's charity, as expected in the Jewish religious system, would allow you to sustain, to survive. That's what it was. This man, this very poor man, who is given the name Lazarus, he has only one chance, this rich man, and yet the rich man steps around him, maybe even over him, and doesn't even see him. How many of us do not see people in our world who are in deep need today? And now with what's happening in our world, there are so many people in need. How many of us demean them, dehumanize them, don't even see them as if they're not even there? But Jesus sees this man and he gives him this name, Lazarus, and it's the only person given a name in a parable other than Abraham in this parable. In the other parables, Jesus doesn't even bother naming the characters, but in this one, he gives them a name for a reason. You see, Lazarus was a very common name in Jesus' culture, and the rich man thought he was important, but Jesus here wants us to focus on the poor man as well, so he gives him a name. And the name Lazarus, 
It comes from this name Eliezer, which is a very common name. The name Lazarus means the one whom God helps. You see how this name, these people are archetypes, they're examples. The very wealthiest and the one that unless God helps him, he's without any chance. And yet we learn in verse 22 that this man that was dumped at the door and this man who lived in the palace both have the same end. In verse 22 we learn they both die. Death is the ultimate equalizer. And then suddenly as that equality happens in death, a sudden and unexpected reversal of fortune is revealed. Jesus tells a very different story and he sets it all into motion to make his point to us and to his audience that day. This death is the equalizer and this short temporary life comes to an end. An entirely different reality emerges. There's a poor man who suddenly has hope, who has wholeness, who has dignity in eternal life, who is known and he's at Abraham's side. He is valued into a Jewish person to be seen at Abraham's side would be what they all longed for, what they all wanted. And yet there's a rich man, the one who had it all that they would have all longed to have been, that we would somewhat, if we're honest perhaps, long to be. And yet suddenly he's without hope. He's without status. He is without dignity. He's in the most undignified possession, suffering in this position of torment in hell. And he finds himself abandoned there for all of eternity. The Pharisees and Jesus' audience, they would have all been in shock hearing this. They, they would not have expected any of this. They wouldn't have expected it. Both men died because we all die. The wealthy man had a great funeral. We're not even told that Lazarus was even remembered. No one may have noticed he was even gone. Yet Jesus gives them a different reality. You see, according to what the Pharisees taught and what all these people would have learned that day, they would have expected that the man who was suffering this life perhaps had gotten what he deserved. Have we ever been guilty in our heart, even though we may know God's word and know better, of seeing someone suffering and figured it was their own fault? Remember what Jesus says to the man that's born blind in John 9, and there, he's being asked, um, you know, which one of these people caused the blindness? Was it something the man did or something his parents did? And Jesus says, no, no, that's not what it's about at all. For them, it was easy. The rich man was blessed by God, and he was going to go to heaven, and God was going to bless him because he was obviously a great person. And the poor guy who was obviously on the outs with God was getting what he deserved. But Jesus paints a very different picture. The rich man, he's in suffering, and the poor man is with Abraham. And while people read a lot into this, Abraham's bosom or all this, this was just Jesus reaching the culture where it was. He's not creating for us a deep theology of heaven that in some way uh, swerves off from the rest of God's word and diverges from what God clearly teaches. The spiritual reality to Jesus' very Jewish audience was to see the contrast that the one they would have thought went to hell was right with Abraham, the carrier of God's old covenant, the one that God made promises to. And right there with God is Lazarus, this poor man, and the rich man, the other man, who seemed to have it all, that God seemed to bless with all the good stuff. He wasn't with God. He wasn't going to be with God. And in fact, we read in verse 26 there was a great chasm, a great gulf, depending on your translation, a, a grand canyon of biblical proportions that no one could cross, a spiritual reality of separation. You see, hell is not like what we think about it being. It's not what's portrayed in popular TV shows like The Good Place. Hell is somewhere that God's word is clear, has continual, eternal torment, unrelented suffering, in every way, a place that is described as having flame and agony and internal agony. You're separated from God and yet you're in physical torment as well. And Jesus wants his audience and he wants us. He wants us all to catch something life-changing. You can have a wonderful, successful, and even a religious good life as a good person and you can still go to hell. You can know all about God and not know God and 
You can know all the things that God's word teaches, yet God has not changed your heart. It's a clear reality. And the rich man still doesn't seem to understand what's occurred or he doesn't want to admit it to himself and what's happening and why he's suffering, why he's in torment. He can't comprehend it. Hell is the surprising conclusion, according to this parable, of a good life that is lived without God. Let that sink in. The rich man had lived a pretty good life. He, we get the idea he was well thought of, and yet it was a life for himself and not for God. His passion in life wasn't for God's kingdom. It was all about him and his kingdom. Just as Jesus was warning those Pharisees last week, and now that choice day in and day out, had set an eternal trajectory for him that placed him apart from God forever. How does this happen? And how do we avoid it? There are some foundational or building blocks, spiritual aspects we're going to cover briefly as we close today. And there are things that remind even us as the good church people, the religious people like the Pharisees that feel that we're good and that we have it together, that Yet, we may not know God, and that can lead us to a trajectory that does not place us in God's presence. We don't want to suffer the same fate as the rich man in this parable. Nobody wants to end up in hell. But if we were to define hell today, it is quite literally the final outcome of a life that is self-focused and self-absorbed and apart from God's grace. And God's grace, as we understand it, is God's saving grace, his special grace. There's lots of technical terms, but what we think of as God's saving grace and what we would even call God's common grace. Because if you have a life that's about you, you won't even recognize that. Common grace is the stuff that God gives us that even if you're not a Christian, that you could appreciate the good things that you have. Life, breath, health, and well-being. The warm sunshine on a summer day or Uh, friendships and and relationships. Maybe you're talking to your neighbors right now during this crisis more than ever. I think when God reminds us of a little bit of what even earthly suffering can look like, we start to recognize even as common grace, if we're not a Christian, let alone do we long for that saving grace beyond suffering we know in this life. But when you're living for yourself, you reject it all. All of God's grace, common or saving, you just reject it all. That's what happens. And what happens in the midst of that is this first building block is we love something, anything in our lives. Maybe it's ourselves, maybe it's something else. We love something more than we love God. We don't appreciate God and all the things he's giving us by his grace, the common things and even the special and specific things that save our souls. We don't appreciate any of it. We don't see God as the master and the Lord over our lives. And We see this with this rich man. Look at verse 25. Abraham says, Son, remember that during your life you received the good things. But you see, he didn't recognize them. He thought he deserved all those things. He thought it was all about him. We're born with this sinful desire to think it's all about us. And we don't want God. And just like the two sons in the parable we looked at, with the prodigal son and the diligent son who were both lost, we, we don't want God. We want the stuff that God provides. Jesus is telling these parables to rend our hearts and to kind of rip them apart so we can put them back together differently. And he's saying, yeah, you don't understand. You want something else. You don't really want me. You want the stuff that I provide. Whatever you are most tempted to love besides God is the foundation. It's kind of a seed of hell to set you in that wrong trajectory. Think of the most broken thing in your soul, the thing that you desire, that thing that tries to creep up and longs to be first in your life. If God grants you the grace to see that today, think about that and how that thing actually can place you on the wrong trajectory in your life. So imagine your most selfish moment, your most prideful moment, or your most greedy moment or that situation. I know that's painful, But imagine that, your most angry outburst, uh, the time that just sin exploded into your life. I'm sure one of those is coming to your mind right now, and that's okay. Think about that. Think about how you have this just bubbling desire for some of that stuff in your life, and it consumes you when that happens. We all have times when our sin seeks to consume us, and there's no room 
for anything else over our want, our desire, our fear, our pride, whatever that sin is. That's what Jesus is warning us about. Jesus is warning us, don't let that take all your energy. Put that energy on God and recognizing him and seeking after him. Seeking after him and what he desires. C.S. Lewis has a great quote that I think sums this up. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. If your deepest desire isn't for God, you're not going to choose anything that's good and redeeming. That trajectory is going to be set. That's that first foundational thing that's going to send you towards the wrong eternal trajectory. The second thing is this. The second way, if you're saying, well, how do I know if that's me? The second thing will help you. It's a diagnostic again. We're giving these litmus tests every week. You have no desire to repent of your sin. Not only do you long for that thing, it bubbles up, it consumes you. You don't even want it to stop. You don't want it to stop. And I don't mean that it, it takes over for a while. I mean, there's just never a time you want it to stop. There's never a time. The rich man, that's certainly him in this story. He doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. He doesn't see why he's in hell. Look at verse 24. He reveals that where he is, he still doesn't understand what's happening. He doesn't even acknowledge Lazarus by name. He doesn't even acknowledge Lazarus other than to refer to him in the third person. He directly talks to Abraham. He starts telling Abraham what to do. He says, Abraham, I want you to order Lazarus to bring me a drop of water. I want you to order Lazarus to go to my brothers. He doesn't even then still treat Lazarus like a person. He thinks Lazarus is still there to do his bidding. He's even talking to Abraham in a sense as if Abraham should be listening to him because he knows better. Without that nudging to repent of the Holy Spirit, you may not even recognize your sin, but if the Holy Spirit is nudging at you, even if you mess up a bunch and you're like, oh my gosh, why do I do that? That's God's Spirit calling you to repentance if you're a Christian. It's calling you back out of hell. And if you're not a Christian, it might be God's grace calling you, drawing you in that you would know him. If you hate your sin, if God is bringing those painful things that you don't want to even think about today into your heart and your mind, I want you to stop right now and thank God. And I know that that sounds strange. But thank God because that means the Holy Spirit is alive and dwelling in you. Or the Holy Spirit, if you're not a Christian, is grabbing on your heart. And Jesus is saying, look, here I am. You're being called back to God or you're being called to God perhaps today for the first time. That's your litmus test as to whether if you feel that the weight of sin, if you just have that moment of remorse where you say, oh my goodness, maybe it's gone on for a long time, but suddenly it's like hitting a brick wall and you see it. That's God's grace at work in your life. That's God's spirit at work in you. And that will change your eternal trajectory. Another one of my favorite authors is D.A. Carson. And he says this, Hell is not filled with people who are deeply sorry for their sins. It is filled with people who for all eternity still shake their puny fist in the face of God Almighty in an endless existence of evil and corruption and shame, and the wrath of God. If God is calling you today, stop and hear from him and thank him. Repent, that means turn away from your sin and go the other direction. That's that second building block in, in Brittany. The third and final one is this. Don't let this moment pass by. If God is talking to you, don't let this moment pass by without surrendering to him whether for the first time, if you've never given your life to Christ, if you know all about God, but you don't know God, give him your life today as we close. Or if you have been a Christian and you know that you stray, just stop in the midst of this moment as God's been stripping away these things in this time in our life and thank him. Just confess the sin to him and thank him for the grace he has that he's leading you back to where you need to be, that he's changing that trajectory. Think about what that means. Look at verse 31 here in our passage. 
Jesus answers the rich man's request. He asks, you know, someone go and warn my brothers, my brothers who walk and talk and look and act and are just like me. You remember, this guy was the archetype for the people in Jesus' audience being led by those religious leaders. And he's in this guy, you know, there's one redeeming quality he's given. He says, just, you know, Abraham, send Lazarus back to warn my brothers. And Jesus here, he says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if one rises from the dead. And that's true. Without spiritual regeneration, no one figures out God in their own puny human understanding. That's what D.A. Carson was trying to get us to understand. It's only when God's grace latches onto us and we just surrender to it because in ourselves, we shake our fists at God. And that's what those Pharisees and those the religious leaders did outside of save maybe Nicodemus. All of them even saw that Christ had risen and they still wouldn't believe it. If God is knocking on the door of your heart today, if God is calling you to place him back in focus, to make him the master and Lord of your life, if God is saying all the stuff you think that it matters, it doesn't matter. Cast it all aside. Change how you live. Change how you love and serve and see other people. See them as humans, as sinful people, just like you and me. We all need God's grace. Friends, we all need it now more than ever. Take a moment today and think about what it means that you and I would be a Lazarus, that we would recognize that we are all the one who God helps, and that we would see others the same way, that we would avoid building our lives on these things that don't matter, that place us on the wrong trajectory for all eternity. I hope you'll join me and considering your own life this week, that you will build it on a foundation that sends it towards where God wants it to be, not just for all eternity, but just tomorrow and the next day, that every choice and every decision would place us in that right heart and that right standing with Jesus. Let's pray. God, that you would grab our hearts. And Lord, if there's anyone listening today who doesn't know you as their Savior, that they would understand what it means to be a Lazarus, that we can't get together, that we need to be the ones that you help, that we understand that we can't place anything above you, that we've got to put everything before you. God, that we can't serve anything but you, that we need to surrender, and that if you're giving us a desire today, if you're giving us a hunger to repent, Lord, that's your way, your down payment of showing your spirit is dwelling in us, or that your spirit may be calling us to surrender to you if we don't know you. So God, that we wouldn't know about you, but even in this time that we say, Jesus, I give my life to you, that all of us would just make that proclamation in our hearts and our lives. I give you everything, God, and where I've strayed and where I place other things in front of you or where I haven't seen other people like the rich man didn't even see Lazarus. God, just forgive me that I would see myself, that I would see everyone around me, my neighbors, my friends, that beggar on the street, that I would see everyone as a Lazarus, the one who God helps. And Lord, that I would seek to love and serve and help and care and minister to them. And God, that you would give me the grace and the strength and the peace in my life to do that this day, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.